Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Mike Noonan, who's going to talk today about who's going to make money in semiconductors going forward, who's not, and why. Mike, what do you see as the big trends going forward that are going to change the dynamics and the economics of this industry? When I think about, you know, the semiconductor industry, you know, in many ways, you know, this is uh, first, perhaps, and then maybe in a bit of a contrarian view, you know, the most exciting time ever to be in semiconductors uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, first, you know, and for the first time, uh, almost every industry, you know, around the world, you know, is dependent upon semiconductors either in a very direct or indirect way. Uh, and, you know, instead of, you know, for the past 50 years, you know, a very serial one end market after another driving the market, you know, starting off with, you know, mill aero, moving to mainframes, mini computers, PCs, you know, networking, uh, eventually mobile. Now we have this proliferation of, of end markets and, uh, and the impact, you know, is greater than ever. Uh, then when you combine that with, you know, the capabilities and the technology that we're able to tap into, you're really utilizing, you know, almost the entire, you know, periodic chart of elements. Uh, well, almost anything you can conceive of is, uh, is something you can implement. And the third aspect of this is uh, a lot of the companies that you know, really were quite successful in that first you know, 50 years of semiconductors, uh, to a certain degree, you know, have lost either A, their enthusiasm, or B, uh, well, lost uh, a lot of the imagination on you know, what to do next. And in many cases, you know, the best idea is to hope to get uh, acquired or perhaps do a stock buyback. And this, I think, creates you know, some tremendous opportunities to make the most of uh, what I believe, and, uh, and people a lot smarter than I you know, believe, is an inflection point in terms of you know, the next era of computing. And uh, as John Hennessy called it, you know, the golden era uh, of computing, that to, uh, really moves us away from a monolithic, uh, you know, very much you know, driven by you know, the traditional understanding of Moore's Law, to one that really is you know, uh, a, a revolution, perhaps, in architecture, and being able to actually embrace uh, a more, much more heterogeneous uh, uh, architecture and, and solution, more of a, a toolbox or a toy box of functionality you know, to get a job done, and also one that doesn't necessarily depend upon you know, increasingly faster and faster transistor FT, and in fact, actually depends upon you know, the right function tapping into a much more efficient memory architecture, you know, to get the job done. Why don't you give us a visual of what this looks like? Oh, we would be very, very happy to. So Moore's Law has obviously been a, the guiding uh, roadmap for 50-something years at this point. What comes after that? Yeah. So uh, I personally believe Moore's Law continues, but it can't continue in the same way that, that it has or perhaps been traditionally uh, interpreted. And the, the way I look at this is, uh, you know, traditional, you know, transistor scaling, you know, as transistor size and feature size, you know, goes to zero. Basically, the implications of that mean that development costs go to infinity. That's not a good thing. And what, what happens is, you know, this, you know, traditional and very linear thinking of, you know, of Moore's Law means there aren't any customers that can afford more advanced technology. And so for the first time really in you know, human history and you know, the history of commerce and technology, uh, you know, more advances that cost more equal a smaller market. But at the same time, we have more companies that are now coming in because everything is going electronic, right? Exactly, exactly. And so uh, well, what we have now is you know, when you start to think about uh, well, you know, innovation is still going to continue, but it doesn't necessarily have to be you know, monolithic. And it isn't always and exclusively about, you know, the, the logic transistor. And in fact, you know, just an, an interesting data point that is, you know, somewhat counterintuitive, you know, the, uh, from a die size area, a leading edge SOC is actually majority memory. But so much, you know, uh, work and optimization has been done to a certain degree, you know, by muscle memory in optimizing the, the, the logic transistor. When in fact, it's actually a decreasing percentage of a die area of a monolithic solution. But to, you know, to uh, give another example, uh, a couple of years ago, I was at a, a conference and the head of uh, you know, Sandy National Labs so, uh, was talking about you know, their computing needs. And here's someone who you know, has some pretty heavy duty computing needs. And he basically told the audience, he says, I don't need you know, faster and more aggressive transistor FT. 
what I need is you know, more memory bandwidth because to a certain degree we're muscle bound. And this I think opens up uh, really uh, uh, new opportunities to, to rethink architectures and we're starting to see that, you know, the emergence of you know, a, a GPU you know, to tackle some of these you know, new tasks from an inference and a training standpoint for AI, the ability to use FPGAs. But all of this really, I think, is also driving a rethink in terms of memory, which, by the way, you know, this past you know, couple of years has been the largest single, single sector of the semiconductor market that's grown the fastest. This is to some extent a, a back to the future type of revelation, right? Mm. Because in the past you put everything on a board and then you put it all onto a chip. Uh, then you put different elements on a chip. Now it's starting to split up not only on the same chip, but also in the same package. Exactly. And so now instead of you know, having to you know, drive you know, smaller feature size to get that level of integration, you can start to think about you know, how do you tap into 2.5 and 3D approaches to have you know, best in class technology to get the right job done. And you know we're starting to see this now in terms of you know being able to go ahead and have you know multiple die stacked so you can have you know very close you know close in memory you know much larger caches, or being able to have the type of integration that you want in a package that necess not necessarily burdens you know a leading edge process you know that's optimized you know for for logic and perhaps you know embedded memory, but it doesn't necessarily do a very good job when it comes to RF interfaces or perhaps you know power transfer. And so you know, the ability now to rethink <clears throat> how to, uh, to extend Moore's law, but do that in a way that really you know, takes advantage of you know, the z-axis, if you will, and embrace you know, the heterogeneous you know, uh, opportunity that's really enabled by you know, a system in a package. And, uh, and to a great degree, you know, like you say, back to the future. You know, it's, it's hybrids, but for the 21st century. So without actually naming names, who do you see is going to benefit from this and who is not? What type of, of business model, what type of architecture? So uh, the type of business model you know, needs to be one that's, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, very agile. Uh, because I think we're, we've you know, we're moved away from, uh, again, one market that drives you know, perhaps a, a single device that's gonna sell you know, 100 million units. And in fact, in, in the world that's you know, much more you know, from an automotive, uh, IOT market, you know, there's going to be thousands and thousands of, of uh, designs that might sell 100,000 units. And so now we've got to start to think about, you know, uh, perhaps, you know, borrowing from other industries, you know, such as the software world, which, you know, is thriving, uh, you know, on the foundation of open source. Well, we start to see that in hardware and the emergence of, you know, RISC-V as, a, as, you know, a movement, much more than just an architecture, and really empowering a lot of innovation, but doing it at a much lower cost basis because of the, the, the open source nature. The other aspect of this is, you know, changing the supply chain. And if every device, and especially ones that, you know, are very expensive and, and, and relying on, you know, these very expensive technologies, you know, every device, you know, requires, you know, one mass set, and also, uh, in the end, uh, uh, one end product, you know, that's a lot of stress and a lot of dependency. But if you can use configurability you know, to be agile and maybe even, you know, have configurability enable, you know, new business models, perhaps even, you know, aftermarket you know, revenue, now you've changed, you know, the supply chain and actually, you know, have taken away what, what has been, you know, the, the real driver for the semiconductor boom and bust cycle you know, over inventory and not being able to have a perfect alignment to what you've built, what you've inventoried, and what you sell starts to go away. And, you know, when you start to think about, you know, having uh, uh, open source with configurability enabling new business models, you know, this becomes really interesting and, and changes the economics. And not too long ago, you know, 10, 15 years ago, many companies thought it was better for them to stay in the light bulb business than to keep their semiconductor division. Fast forward to, you know, to you know, 10 years later, the companies that are you know, growing the fastest and have the largest market cap far you know, uh, have uh, outgrown their former parent companies who were sticking with uh, basically you know, uh, technology and thinking that you know, went back all the way to Thomas Edison. We're not actually looking at companies going out of business that are in the, the leading position in the industry, though. What we're looking at is potentially more things that go alongside these because the technology is just getting a lot more complicated, right? So now you have things have to work in harmony, and they also have to work more securely together. That's right. All of that puts a burden on the, the system level type of 
analysis and design and architecture. That's right. That's right. And it really is a, a reminder of, you know, the semiconductor world and, and the systems that semiconductors enable are the most complex systems that humans have ever developed. And, you know, if you just live at the physical layer, uh, you really, you know, not only uh, uh, you know, undermine, you know, the end application, but as you suggest, you know, create some vulnerabilities. And, and this is one of the reasons why I think we, we see a lot of, you know, systems companies, you know, now almost coming full circle back to the early days of ASIC and realizing that, you know, not only is it in their best interest to manage this complexity by, you know, developing entire solutions, you know, their own silicon, you know, with software and uh, an overall user experience that's optimized by having a much more holistic uh, you know, solution. They also realize that, you know, they can better manage and in fact improve, you know, the security vulnerabilities, you know, that are really created by having, you know, this explosion of devices, you know, the, the secure tiny devices that are needed, you know, to enable big data. And that's a, a, a daunting challenge, but also an opportunity and one that uh, we think is uh, uh, you know, very exciting you know, for, for companies uh, all across the world. And this is why we're seeing so many startups coming into the market for the first time in a very long time, right? Uh, that's exactly right. And so, you know, again, it gets back to when you, you know, rethink uh, the, the, the challenge of developing a semiconductor and really you know, view it as more of part of an overall solution, uh, and you know, start to tap into you know again this concept of more of a heterogeneous toolbox. You can do amazing things, but it really requires you know a much more <clears throat> solutions uh, perspective, <clears throat> and that's where yeah, I think uh, a lot of perhaps you know, old world semiconductor companies, which in many cases you know kind of viewed you know software as you know perhaps a necessity, or I've even heard it referred to as the gift wrapping department that they can never figure out how to charge for. Uh, it uh, uh, really, uh, uh, I think, uh, 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 delivers a, a better product and also captures a lot of value that perhaps, you know, a traditional semiconductor company had almost abdicated to someone else, which, you know, I think conspired to uh, have a, you know, a, a couple of, uh, you know, headwinds, if you will, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, less valuation, you know, back 10, 15 years ago uh, uh, for semiconductor companies, particularly when, uh, uh, you know, costs, didn't fall faster than prices. And then the other, uh, other part about this is, you know, I think uh, an, an explosion of people who have good ideas and really realize that you know, with these new economics and you know, tapping into open source hardware, you know, configurable solutions, you know, sometimes using non-volatile memory to get that configurability, they can lower the cost basis but also reduce their market risk. And you know, this comes together, I think, in a very exciting way and almost a renaissance, if you will, in terms of you know, both innovation and investment into, into semiconductors. And you know, just a couple of years ago, you know, investors on Sand Hill Road were treating silicon more like plutonium, didn't want to touch it. Now we've reached you know, almost back to the, to the peaks of you know, the 1990s in terms of investment into this sector, but with you know, a new approach with also, uh, I think, a new uh, ambition for the end markets that we serve. And we also have a lot of very new markets that didn't exist before at all. So you've got automotive electronics, you've got AI, which was pretty much stalled out for, what, 25 years? That's right. You've got uh, cloud, which is brand new. Virtual and augmented reality are on the horizon. So these are, are brand new things, medical electronics as well. That's right. You know, it, I think we'd be hard pressed to think of an industry that hasn't been impacted in a positive way and one that actually isn't going to become more dependent upon some level of connectivity and intelligence. And connect, connectivity and intelligence basically are delivered by you know, advanced semiconductor solutions. And everything from uh, agriculture all the way through entertainment, you know, every industry now is impacted, which is one of the reasons why, you know, uh, for the first time, you know, the overall industry crosses a half you know, trillion dollars. And in fact, I think you know, this is the best time, and, and perhaps, you know, again, in the words of John Hennessy, a, a golden age. And, and it's not even just a half trillion dollars. Now we don't even have a way to measure it because it's now influencing other things, That's right. right? That's exactly right. And I, and I think, uh, you know, really, you know, semiconductors and to a certain degree, electrical engineering is more of a tool than necessarily, necessarily end market. And, you know, this enables, you know, uh, what, uh, what really is, I think, evolving, you know, so many industries and uh, uh, you know, being more efficient and, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and opening up new opportunities because of this ubiquitous connectivity uh, and doing it in a way that adds intelligence, as long as you also don't forget security. Because at the same time, you know, all of this connectivity you know, can bring about, if it's not done correctly, 
uh, with vulnerabilities that can have you know uh, with some pretty serious you know, downside consequences. Mike Noonan, as always, thanks for a great explanation. Well, my, my pleasure, and it's you know, been a, a distinct honor to be able to talk with you today, and I really enjoyed our, con our conversation.